and over and I got it for a good price. And the day the walkthrough, we walked into the property, we walked into the basement, I was like, that door shouldn't be open. The side door is open in the house. Go in and yep, they cut all the copper uh, out of the basement. This is where you learn from Ron Ferracci. Hey, you learn you know what you do with your copper as soon as you install it? Guys, you paint it because if it's dirty copper, it's not worth as much. Don't ever let your copper be clean. I'm serious. I was like, there's probably a lot of other stuff they could have sold, but you know. Copper's pretty cheap because it's soft, so it's easy to cut through, and it's, it's dollars per pound. So it's worth it, and it's relatively light. So I use PEX. I like PEX better at this point. But three or four times, you get his copper taken out. Now, do you think that happened in the West Hartford properties? He doesn't have any in West Hartford, but do you think it does? No. So that's, that's why it's a lie in Hartford and Waterbury because they don't price in how, di how much less you're going to make because of your higher bad debts and um, also the additional maintenance that you're going to have and things like that. Like tenants in Hartford and Waterbury wear on properties more than like West Hartford, for instance. It's just, it, it is a fact, unfortunately, okay? Um, so, so that's what they would be in estimated currents. Any that you would estimate over long periods of time so you can smooth out the variability from year to year, okay? And uh, the cap rate for me, it works really good in higher, higher interest rate environments, right? If, 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 we were, if I were to ask any of the realtors in the room, how many realtors are supporting people that are buying stuff in cash right now and how many are buying the ones that are financed? Anyone? Cash? Does anyone have significantly financed properties right now? They're all cash offers, pretty much. It's because you can't justify the cost based on the interest rates because the interest rates are 7 or 8% and the cap rates are 6%. So you're going into a situation where you have negative cash flow from day one, and that doesn't really work unless you actually have cash. So what happens when you have high interest rate environments is you work from a, a strongly financed environment to a strongly cash environment. Okay, so, so then we'd say, what's the other strategy? So buy and hold cash on cash rate. So what is the cash on cash? So the cash on cash is the expected return on invested cash when buying a property with a loan, and therefore it should include principal and interest. So the cash on cash is your net operating income, and then we're going to subtract the principal and interest, divided by your loan, plus your closing costs, plus any immediate repairs that you have to do because they take cash, right? So if you buy something that's really, really bad and you end up putting $100,000 in, your cash in cash is not going to be as high. This is why anytime you have a bad property, you should buy it in cash. Then you should basically fix it up and refinance it so you can get as much of the equity out. People do it so often where they end up screwing up their things. They have a little bit of money and they end up buying the property with a mortgage and then they, end up basically, then they end up basically doing all this work and they can't get their cash out easily, right? Without doing another closing and paying another 5% based on closing costs, right? So you don't want to do that. So that's where it could even be better to do a hard money lender because maybe some of the fees are not as high and then end up doing it. Or just, this is where private money is good. Find your Aunt Sally who's got a lot of money and then basically give her 6 8% and, and then uh, give it back to her quickly after you renovate the property, okay? So, so again, cash on cash is the net operating income minus the principal and interest divided by the loan plus closing costs plus repairs times 100%. Okay, I'm going a little bit long. So this works great in low interest rate environments. No or low money down loans can make returns look really great. This is why everyone was buying as low money down as they could and why housing prices went up like crazy, okay? Purchase price raise, I should probably say rises. Purchase, purchase price go up like crazy, but it's a house of cards. If the market decreases, mortgages are upside down and you cannot sell, okay? So that's the difference between cash and cash. This is my favorite rate. I, I would like to think that I coined this. I have never seen this in bigger pockets or in any other medium, but I like to, my favorite metric to invest is cap rate minus the prevailing interest rate. Right, because that's essentially your return profile. If an interest rate's seven and you're buying a six cap, you're gonna have a negative one. So you're gonna have to invest money into the deal. Like it just happens that way. So as interest rates rise, I buy at higher cap rates, I buy houses cheaper, okay? As interest rates fall, I buy at lower cap rates, so I buy houses for more. So what do you guys think I'm doing right now? I'm not buying. Because the housing prices have not gone down even though the interest rates have gone up. So this is why a bunch of us investors really have not bought much in the market. 
the vast majority of the things that are changing hands right now are owner occupants because their equations and how they calculate things are different. You're never going to win against owner occupants because they think about a house differently. It is the place that they are going to live, whereas it's a place where we're trying to make money. So people that live there will always pay more than someone that's trying to make an investment. Does that make sense? So cash on cash breaks down as interest rates rise. The cap rate is generally 6 to 8%. If interest rates are 6 to 8%, your debt service swamps your cash flow. And then cap rate breaks down as interest rates fall. Since the cash on cash increases like crazy with interest rates, people will overpay due to cheap money. And that's what we saw. It's all just economics, guys. It's pretty simple. All right. So one more thing I want to say about uh, evaluating real estate, and I'm almost done. The cap rate can actually be really high with a negative cash flow. How does that make any sense? How can I have a 10 cap and I'm actually losing money, right? Well, if I have lots of CapEx, if I buy a property that has a lot of vacancy, if I have a bad debt because I bought a property that, a tenant, that an owner mismanaged, um, I, can, I, can make I can make a lot of money eventually, but I won't make it right now. I bought a bunch of properties like that. They're wonderful because the owner feels a pain and they're willing to pay it, give it to you for a deal because they feel that pain. They're not making any money. So you're not going to make money, but now you turn it around, and so you actually make it, make it good. So this is the ones that I like to buy. I like to buy properties that have lots of deferred maintenance. Okay? Now, now, cap rate can be negative with high cash flow. Sorry, go ahead. Sure. So we say it. So if you have no CapEx, right, you don't have roofs, you have, this, you have all your tenants paying the rent, so you don't have the vacancy or bad debt occurring during a period. You can have cash flow, but you won't have that cash flow if, it, if you take it over a 30 year period, right? Because you just, certain things are variable, like putting a roof on. If a person just put a roof on, you don't have to pay for a roof. So if everything goes well, if the stars are aligned with you, you can make money, but you can have negative cap rate. Because a cap rate is really your expected return. Does that make sense? Okay. And then the cap rate can be a current estimate or a pro forma estimate. The current estimate is based on the expected return as it stands, but the pro forma makes assumptions, they're always positive, they're liars, um, that it will perform better in the future, you're gonna raise rents and or you're gonna figure out ways to reduce expenses. Any questions on this? Okay. So, um, so how to make a good deal great. So hopefully you guys got a lot about like deals and stuff and how things are done. So I, I came up with five ways, and I want to talk about this as a group with the last few minutes, uh, that we can make a good deal great. So we can do like my dad, and we can wait forever. You can wait a day, a week, a month, a year. Uh, but if you wait forever, people are going to think that you are a savant. My dad has bought property so bad for so long, he never... He, couldn't, he would learn as much as all you guys from this analysis, and he's been investing in real estate for the, my entire life. And he would learn just as much as all of you because he never knew how to run deals. My dad loves land and he loves barns. That's like his things for some reason. Land and barns, okay? But you know what people see when they see my dad because he's, he's a multimillionaire? They say, wow, you shit gold. He's got the Midas touch of poop, right? That's literally what they tell him when they see him. But is it because of the fact that he's smarter than anyone in your room? No, he just waited forever. He sold three properties in his entire life. You wait forever, you're gonna make money in real estate, okay? So how, that's one way to how to make a good deal great, is wait forever, never sell. So buy in places that you wanna hold forever, okay? Now, you can work, right? What does this mean? Well, you could sub it out, but if you're smart and you know that there's a, something leaking, a, a faucet leaking, you don't call a plumber, you call a handyman. Right? So you can downtrade it. Instead of doing it where it's a router company, you do a handyman. You, know, you try to find a person that can do it more cost effectively. Okay? Or you do it yourself. If you want to save money, if you want to basically make a good deal great, you've got to put in the work and you've got to do it yourself. Does that make sense? Then some of it's creativity. Right? Can you figure it out and can you figure out ways to not pay full price? Right? There's all sorts of things that we can do with it to try to figure out other ways to do it or don't pay full price. So with property management companies, people are like, oh, my electricity's out. Do you know what some people do? They just send an electrician. You know what I do? I send them a YouTube video. I say, here's how you actually reset a breaker box. After you do that, 
If it doesn't work, let me know and I'll send an electrician. If it ends up being that the breaker just had to be flipped back, I'm gonna charge you back because you should have figured that out yourself, okay? So use a little creativity to figure it out and or figure out ways to not pay full price. What's so funny about that? You have to be, right? Because if, if you're paying for the vendor to go out there, then it's on you. Whereas if you tell them, it's on them, right? This is what it has to be. You have to be firm but fair and realistic, right? Everyone, you know, you jump. If, 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 a, if a tenant calls you and you jump and you go right over there, what do they say? Every time they're going to call you back and you're going to jump for them. But they got you, right? And, and then you, you really are making a very active, active work, okay? Now, perseverance, we want to never give up, right? We want to continue to do it. So many people, they do sell within the five or six or seven years. Then prioritization, can we figure out ways that we can do things to save time? Because time is money in this game, right? Vacancy, if you can figure out ways to get it rented faster, to get a vendor in there quicker to turn it, we're going to save time, which is going to give us more money. It's going to reduce our vacancy period, okay? And then we can learn from others, but build a network, right? What do they say? That, that your network is your net worth, right? So being here, networking with people, finding vendors, exchanging names, doing that is very, very powerful. So here's what I want to do. Here's my last slide. Gah! I don't know. No, this was perfect. And then I just yeah, push the one slide. Throw it at you. So, um, so what I want to do now, and this was the last few minutes, because I want to really have you guys learn how to make a good deal. How, what makes a good deal better? What makes a good deal and how can I make it better? Yeah, that's perfect. So we talked about this before. These are the things that I have in my, in my physical um, analysis for cap rate, right? And it's pretty simple. You add up your incomes, you subtract your expenses, things like that. So what, can I, what are ways that I can do to increase rent? Okay, what does that mean? That means whenever the lease is up, you call the tenant and you let them know rent is increasing. You do market analyses on a regular basis. Did you guys all know that in the last like three years, rents are up 30%? Did you know that? Some people don't. So keep yourself educated. And when the lease is up, you tell them that their rent is going up. Or you consciously don't, and you know that you're giving them charity for some reason, right? So do the work. Go ahead, John. Where do you, where do you go and keep track on the rising? So one of the ways you can do it, there's a HUD uh, for Section 8. You can do the HUD guidelines, and you can see what that is, and you can kind of keep different spreadsheets of it from year to year. Um, and that's one way to do it, right? Because if you see a HUD guideline go up 10%, then you know basically it's gone up 10% everywhere. So that's one place. So, so, but it's putting in the work. It's saying, okay, I know that I should be able to get this much rent and I want to do it. Other income, are you charging for parking? Are you charging for pets? Are you charging those things? Are you getting the other income, the other ancillary revenue streams so that you can actually raise, uh, you can raise your gross income, right? Makes sense? Uh, taxes, how can you increase or decrease taxes? Can you? Reassessments, put in the work, ask them, say the taxes are too high and here's the reason why. And it'll happen, a lot of times they just want you to go away. They'll give you a 10% or 20% bonus. And guess what, is it a 10% bonus for one year? No, it's at least five years. So you taxes, challenge them. Absolutely, absolutely, put in the work. No, they'll never raise it. They, won't, they, won't raise it. they cannot go in and say, no, well, you're coming here to contest me. I'm going to raise it more. No. Go after the assessment. Is it better if you have a lawyer go for you, or are you better off? Your are you trying to save money, or are you trying to spend money? I'm just saying, <laughs> if you're going to save money on taxes, you're going to save money on taxes. Well, I, so it's really about, so, so what are the, this is a, this is a, it's, it's an emotionless exercise. So you say, okay, here's some comps. And here's ultimately what they sold for. Here's my property, which is similar. And so you're assessing me as way higher than you should be. You want to hear the biggest scam? What is the assessment in Connecticut? What, when you get assessed, what number do they give you? 70% of the value. Why? Because they don't want you to contest it. So if they gave you the 100% value, my house is not worth 300. 70%. You get a number that says 240. Yeah, my house is worth more than 240. It's a lie. It's 70%. They're saying it's worth 300. They're playing games with us to not have us contest assessments. Contest your assessments. I did it. It takes five minutes. 
okay? You send it out to the person and you ultimately do that. Now, I think I got one of my six or eight actually reduced. And I, I probably should have fought it a little bit more, but it wasn't that big of a deal to me. Okay, insurance, how do we, how do we decrease insurance costs? Shop it. Shop it, that's one, what else? Self-insure, I self-insure. What does that mean? So let me ask you guys a question. Who, who here has had a car accident? Anyone? Okay. When you got a car accident, what happened to your insurance after your car accident? Goes up. Goes up. So if I have a flood in my basement and I end up calling in to basically pay, have the insurance cover it, what's going to happen to my insurance coverage the next year? It's going to go up. So if I, instead of that, instead of it being a 1,000 limit, raise it to a $5,000 limit, if that same flood happens, am I going to get the insurance involved? Or because my deductible is 5,000, am I just going to do it myself? So when that happens, what, is, what happens to my insurance the next year? It doesn't go up because I never put a claim in, right? So by self-insuring, so I have a bunch of properties, and raising it to the highest deductible that you are happy to do, you can generally save about $500 per property, at least. So if I have 10 properties and I have 20, and I have never put a claim in my life, every year I'm saving 10 grand, every single year. That covers, my, covers the cost to you know, redo a kitchen or something that I need to do, and I'm not putting a claim in, so they're not gonna drop me or raise my insurance. Does that make sense? Do the same thing with your autos, right? Have it as high of an ins a deductible as you can, and you'll see how much money you're gonna save. It's like 30%. It's crazy high. Because they also realize, the insurance company, that if your deductible is lower, you're more likely to use it, right? So you are more risky when your deductible is lower. So it's a higher price, and they know they're going to gouge you later. It's all a game. So self-insure. Raise it to the highest deductible, and then only put in a claim if it's a catastrophic issue. Does that make sense, guys? Okay. Uh, water sewer. I don't know how you, I guess what you can do is you can put low flow toilets in, low flow water things. A lot of times what I'll do is I'll go in and I'll, I'll put in pressure reducing valves, so not as much water flows, but you can do things like that to reduce your water, water uh, usage, okay? Don't let tenants wash cars on your properties. Cap any exterior hoses. So all things that you should do, okay? What about trash? So here's one, if you have a single family home, make the tenants pay the trash. Right? Even a multifamily home, you could probably make them pay trash or reimburse you for trash pickup, right? Or say go to the dump or whatever else. It might not fly that well, but you can probably reduce trash costs sometimes. Okay, what about maintenance? How do you reduce maintenance cost? Do it yourself, right? Or if you have free time, network, find additional vendors that maybe are more cost effective, right? Because if you call when you need someone, you're not going to get a good price. So putting in the work up, up ahead of time to find vendors that are gonna give you a good price is something very valuable to be able to make it so that your maintenance expense is lower. Supplies, I mean, you can basically find sales. I don't know if that, I have a good one for that because you don't really know what you need, but you look at people like David Haberfeld and he's always got supplies of everything lying down. He's got pallets of this and that, like he just does it, right? Right, so I mean, that's a way to do it, but like, like, like if you know you've got a lot of flips and stuff, having pallets and pallets of flooring could be good. I'm gonna use the same flooring everywhere and I'm gonna get a good price. Electric, how can you reduce electric costs? So you do an energy audit, right? You can actually, if you're paying for it, there's Energize CT and you can try to find a lower generation rate and you can call in to get that reduced, right? You can do certain things to kind of limit, limit the, the, uh, the electric cost in your units somewhat with energy audits and things like that. Make sense, good, sure. Electric baseboard? So electric baseboard's terrible because it's super expensive. Most tenants will not stay as long with electric. If you do electric heat pumps, it's better because it also can be functioned as an air conditioning system. They have a lot of really nice like Mitsubishi mini splits and things that, that are very, very sleek and people like. But if you go electric baseboard heat, your tenants will not last, will not stay as long as if you have gas. So what do you suggest for heat? I do, I do gas wherever I can. I do. All right, so heat and hot water, again, this, how do you save heat and hot water costs? You could split stuff. I had a single, a three family that had one heating system, but it had three zones. And the first thing I did was ripped out that heating system and put three heating systems in. Cost me a lot of money. Cost me probably $20,000. But ultimately it allowed me to now charge that back to the tenants. And do you think tenants think that heat and electricity and stuff cost two, $300 a month? No. no. 
So you get more if you actually make them pay for it and they're more thoughtful of it. They're not heating the house with the windows open. It happens, guys. Like it's, it's super hot. All right, so capital expenditures. You can plan them. If you, do, uh, if you have to do a brand new furnace in the wintertime, you think you're gonna pay more than during the spring or summer? The HVAC guys are looking for work. They'd love to do heating systems at that point. So plan your capital expenditures when you don't have to do it, okay? Lawn care and snow care, you can push a lawnmower. Again, talk to your vendors, try to find more effective cost solutions. Property management, do it yourself. Shop that if you want, call me, but I am expensive. Um, Bad debt, right? That's a lot of it's about screening your tenants better, getting the right person in. If a person has had eviction already, do you think they're more, and more likely to get another eviction than a person that's never had an eviction? The same likely or less likely? What do you guys think? If a person's been evicted before, do you think they're more likely to be evicted again than another person being evicted for the first time? Way more, right? So if you allow yourself to put in tenants that have questionable character, because of evictions and the screening that you do, you're gonna set yourself up for higher bad debt levels. Vacancy, when a unit goes vacant, how quickly are you in there getting a scope of work, getting vendors lined up to get the work done, getting it painted, get everything done so you can get it back on the market? Are you going out with friends on a weekend or are you actually getting it done, right? That's how we reduce vacancy. And then principal and interest, we refinance when rates go down. We can do things like that so we can control to some level every single part of our, capital, of our, of our um, cap rate calculation by doing the work. It's hard, this is why a lot of people don't succeed, but if you're like my dad, who does all of these things himself, you're gonna be a multimillionaire. I have no doubt about it, right? But the persistence and being able to do that and being willing to do that, what other people are not willing to do, that's what separates who's going to be a millionaire and who's going to be like everyone else flaming out in five to six years. Right, so is that you? Or are you the one that's gonna put in the work? It's really that simple, ultimately. You willing to put in the work? And ultimately, you can make a good deal that much better. Thanks. That. So you guys can hang out. Thank you so much for coming through. You can get more drinks, you can talk, network. Um, we here until you guys want to leave. Do you guys so. have any questions? What, I guess, when did you start buying properties? So I, I started buying properties back in uh, 2012. So it was like, it was interesting, right? So it's very popular to buy real estate right now. Who here bought a property either on or before 2012? Anyone in this room? Got Irving, anyone else? Go ahead, couple more. All right, so back in 2012, when you were buying property, what did people say about you? Did they say, oh, that's cool, you're buying property, this is amazing. Like, I wanna buy property. No, they thought we were stupid. I had my brother and other people that were like, you're an idiot, like, you're buying single family homes? They never cash flow. And now everyone is in vogue to buy single family homes, like Blackstones and everyone else. I was doing it back in 2012, before they were. Right, because you gotta find your own way of making money in this game, be it real estate, be it commercial buildings, be it whatever, right? There's plenty of ways to make money in this game, so. But, so, so you buy, no matter the market, you're still buying? Uh, I'm, I'm, so what my philosophy, so going back a few, a few things. Um, the housing crisis was what, 2000 and? 2008. Okay. Uh, so I, I have a very strong belief um, on this one that I, I haven't verbalized. So if you look at the three approaches, one of the things that I, I recognize is the most important thing that really di dictates what a house is worth is not, and it kind of goes back to what you were saying about, well, would it really appraise? It's really the cost approach that really defines things. Because let's say that we have a situation in this country like we do where there's not enough housing. So what does that mean? That means we need to build more. But is it more costly to build right now than it was a few years ago, or is it less costly? Or the same costly? A lot more. So what does that mean? That means that we need to get a good return profile to justify the cost to build, right? So if it costs a lot to build, until we can get the return, no one's gonna build. So back in 2012, when I was buying, I was buying single family homes that needed nothing for $80,000. 
How would you guys like to buy a single family home that needs nothing for $80,000? 10. 10. And he'll, he'll buy them with a wholesale deal and probably give me 50,000. I bought three in one day. Three. They were like $100,000 a piece. And it needed a little bit of paint and resurfacing floors. Right? So like, but everyone was like, well, you're buying housing? Like, like that's, that's a terrible idea. Right? So, but you have to zig when others are zagging. You have to have the courage of conviction. And my conviction was that cost, cost, houses cost a lot more to build than $80,000. They have to continue to go up. Like my dad, I need to wait long enough. Sorry, what was going on? Why did, um, why did you choose a single family over a multi-family? Well, because, and, great question. Single families are based on what approach? Sales, sales. sales approach. So was... was I'm a buy and hold, a buy and hold investor. So, but, but let, me, let me just take this, just hear me out. So everyone was losing their house. So were people trying to buy single family homes? No, no one was, they were unloved. Were people still buying multi, multi-family based on income? Yeah, so I didn't, ca I cash flowed like almost nothing, but I recognized that they were gonna have to come up back in value because it cost way more to build them new than it was than what I was getting them for. I was basically getting them a little bit above land value. Your plan was to refi out of it? I did, I refied out of most of them. I 1031'd three times into multifamily investments, years later. But that was the plan, yep. Oh, so you did sell some. I, I ended up selling uh, in 2021 five properties and bought three, but I sold seven units and I bought 14. So I bought a seven family, a four family, and a three family. No, I, I sold seven. I sold, uh, I sold seven units, five properties. I bought three properties and 14 units. So I flipped it from mostly single families into big multifamilies. Sorry, you have a question? What's your thoughts on like, um, creating like a condo space, like three to four units? Like, like yeah. Managing like an HOA, like what's the pros and cons of, of, of creating like condos? So, so, um, so you're asking two different questions there. So what is my thoughts on building condos and managing condos? Or like... I'm just saying, like, if you have an opportunity to create, yeah. you know, four condos, yeah. you know, essentially four so, condos. So con one of the big expenses on condos is actually generating the bylaws and a lot of that infrastructure. Um, I don't ever want to do that. I don't like condos. I don't own any condos, and I hope to never own condos. Me personally, uh, I don't like to be beholden to uh, other, other people with respect to like associations and things. But we have talked about development, but it's the same question is if the cost to develop can't be justified in the income that you're receiving, then it doesn't happen until the income justifies the cost. So my belief why I'm not selling my properties, though I'm not buying any properties, is that I think rents in Connecticut specifically are gonna go up 5% year over year for the next five years. I think it is. Hey guys, on the interest of time, I'll, I'll let you get your, your last question in then. Uh, after that, we'll, uh, you know, we'll break out for, for networking and you can all barrage him with your questions after that, sure. right? Thanks guys. All right, fine, yeah. I'll Make it a good one, last question. All right, I'll try, I'll try. I'm just like curious about your take in general about like, Building and development as a as a form of investing, like is that good in a rising market? A, a, a market like uh, so it's best in a low interest rate environment. So I tried to do development with my dad has some land. I told you he loves land and barns. So we had some land, and I tried to find developers over the last few years to work with him. Here's why: developers love low interest rates environments because if I am a landowner that has land and cash, I can use that as the twenty percent collateral for the debt. I can use the land value itself, even though it's farmland, I'm repurposing it as developable land and I can use it against debt. So now developers can come in and willing to put in the time, they can do it with zero money out of pocket. So developing sucks right now. You look at people and like, like, there's, like the number of new housing starts is starting to crash. Like people are finishing up the things that they have to because they got themselves into it, they're gonna finish it because otherwise they really lost everything. But we're not going to see a lot, more a lot more development until the interest rates go down or the rents go up. All right? 